not nervous. <laughs> For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Tonight, from Boston, Massachusetts, we bring you the Pepsodent Show, starring Bob Hope and his special guest, Fred Allen. <laughs> How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Broadcasting from Boston, where the Cabots speak only to the Lowells and no others. And I speak only to Lever Brothers Hope. <laughs> Telling you to use Pepsi and get in those twice-a-day licks, and you'll get over with the chicks like a ton of bricks, because your choppers won't look like something left over from 76. <laughs> Had enough? <clears throat> Vote for Pepsi. Well, here we are in good old Boston. You know Boston. That's a history book that's been subdivided. I sent Mayor Curley a letter telling him that I was coming to Boston, but it was returned unopened. I guess he didn't want to have anything to do with the mails. Enjoying my visit to New England, even though I've had a grudge against Massachusetts ever since I was a kid, made me lose more spelling bees. <laughs> and there's two kinds of people in Boston, Democrats, and I forget what the other guy is. <laughs> but I really love New England, and you can always tell whether when you're in Maine or Vermont. The people there don't use zippers on any of their clothing, no siree, not while there's a Hoover button left. <laughs> And the streets here in Boston are very crooked and complicated, and it's hard to tell where you're going. This is the only town I ever saw where the traffic signals light up and say, Stop, go, and give up. <laughs> the streets, what crooked streets? What crooked streets? Today I was following a blonde, and after two blocks, she was following me. <laughs> and they have statues in the parks of all the famous people who have died here. Paul Revere, Henry Cabot, and Ted Williams. <laughs> Ted Williams, we should have him in Cleveland next year, that's all. What a World Series. They still have a meat shortage here because nobody will mention the word slaughter. You can still hear Cronin groaning. Yes, sir, that's my Joe. And Harvard is very near here. And Harvard really leaves a stamp on a man. Even when one of them fails, he becomes a bum of distinction. <laughs> I'm, I'm very thrilled to be here, and I just want you to know that I just wrote a book called So This Is Peace, and I'm happy to say it hasn't even been banned in Boston. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the censors refuse to read it. <laughs> Congratulations on those twins. That's really wonderful. Everybody is having a great time here in Boston, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it's such a social town. Up here, you're always meeting women who are the cream of society. Yo -ho, Mr. Hope! And then there's the homogenized type, Miss Vera Vane, right here. Well, Miss Vane. Oh, yes, of the Beacon Hill, Vane. <laughs> oh. You look more like a landslide. <laughs> My lord, yes, I'd ignore you. <laughs> well, how do you like it here in Boston, Mass? <laughs> you keep your words closer together, young man, or you'll find your teeth further apart. Well, I love it here. I'm an old Bostonian myself, Miss Vague. You know, I'm strictly back bay. Oh, yes. <laughs> 
that's no puzzle you have in the front either. You know, you know my ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Oh, really? Is what? Barnacles? <laughs> Uh, believe me, I could mention a few tales about my ancestors. Oh, uh, you don't have to, Mr. Hope. I've seen them swinging by, though. Well, they pick up a little money as extras in Tarzan pictures. I'll let you. Oh, no, but really, I just love Beacon Hill, Mr. You Hope. You do? Here in Boston, it's so wonderful. You know, women take their rightful place in society as leaders. You know, here, women rule the roost. Really? Well, would you like to rule the roost? Well, yes, you'd have had the right type of roosters. <laughs> I've noticed that you're quite popular with Boston men. Oh, have you? <laughs> well, I think it's my technique that gets them, Mr. Hope. Come here, and I'll show you. <laughs> oh, you just want to get your arms around a big, strong, virile man, huh? Oh, yes, but meantime, you'll do. <laughs> Wait a minute. What do you mean by that? Oh, just what everybody in Boston does. When you can't get steak, take a lobster. <laughs> proud and thrilled to present to you a local boy whom all of us in show business respect, admire, and love. An entertainer's entertainer and a great talent. Uh, what's your name, son? Fred Allen. <laughs> Fred Allen. <laughs> Stop rolling him. How does it feel? How does it feel to be back in your old hometown of Boston? Well, great. You know, Bob, I owe everything I am today to Boston. No kidding. I thought it was Portland. <laughs> Say, well, it must be great to be back where you spent your childhood when you were still known as John Florence Sullivan. <laughs> Bob, frankly, I never think of my childhood. You know, my mother was trying to get rid of me. Your mother was trying to get rid of you? Yes, sir. When you live in Charlestown and your mother gives you the name of Florence, she's trying to get rid of you. Well, I lived in a tough neighborhood in Cleveland, Fred. Really? At the age of three, I was repaint man for a hot tricycle ring. <laughs> How is it you don't talk like the other Bostonians? Well, don't uh, don't blame the way I talk on Boston, Bob. It's my it's my sinuses. I have the only nasal twang in the country with a union card from Petrillo. <laughs> That's wonderful. I wonder if I'd get bigger laughs if I talked through my nose. I don't think so, Bob. Your jokes would have so far to go. <laughs> They'd be coming out on the skeleton program, and he can use them. Oh, no, just read what's written there, please. Yes, we'd be wasting our time, Bob. No matter what we say about them, they're both coming out on top. <laughs> We tried, anyway. Hey, did you know that Benny refers to you as the louse that Jack built? For your information, Mr. Hope, Robert, Benny is so low he can sit in the shade of a shoe tree. The sponsor sent it in. We had to tell it. I mean, what... Say, listen, but uh, <clears throat> that threw me a little, too. I mean, uh, tell me, tell me Fred, why didn't you stay in Hollywood? I thought well, we cut that. I guess so. <laughs> I put it back After that low, we can use it, can't it's we? A... Tell me, Fred, why didn't you stay in Hollywood? Well, it's those clothes you wear out there, Bob. They're so casual. The last time I was in Hollywood, I saw a picture of Whistler's mother, and the old lady was sitting in her rocking chair wearing a polo shirt and slacks. <laughs> yeah, but he dresses up more since he bought the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> see why you guys are always yelling about California, Bob? Rain half the year, blistering some the other half, eating in drive-ins, and being served by those girls in sunsuits. You know, Fred, you're an older man than I thought. 
But you're not going to get me to knock the East, Fred. I got my start in vaudeville right here. Tell me, Bob, did you do a single act or an act with a partner? Well, I did a single act. My partner just parked at the stage door with the motor running. <laughs> Were the audiences tough? Not too tough. I got my own head back. <laughs> well, better luck next time. <laughs> This is double information, please. You have to think of the answers to the answer. <laughs> Say, uh, what kind of an act did you do in Porterville, Fred? Well, I was a juggler, Bob. I used to juggle 64 plates, 48 sauces, 20 beer bottles, and a small boy on a bicycle, and kept the bell on the bicycle ringing at the same time. But I, I gave it up, old man, gave it up. Why? I had to. I couldn't never figure out what to do with my other hand. <laughs> Hello? With whom did you desire to converse? Hmm? With whom did you desire to converse? <laughs> Must be a local boy. <laughs> well, Professor Colonna, how are you? Okay? Hey! You're a new melody too, aren't you? Hey, you were born in Boston. Tell me, did you go to school here? Yes, hope I went to MIT. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology? No, the Morons Institute. <laughs> But, Kelowna, how about the tea? Wonderful. Shall I pour? Bob, to, uh, Bob, to whom are you talking there? Oh, it's Professor Kelowna, Fred. You know the professor, don't you? Oh, yes. My cocker spaniel and his mustache go to the same veterinarian. <laughs> you mind if I speak to him? Not at all. Hello, Kelowna. Oh, hello, Bostonian. Hello, Smithsonian. Uh, say, aren't you the one I went to school with, the Kelowna I went to school with? <laughs> school? Total stranger. <laughs> Kelowna, this is your old playmate, Fred Allen. Baggy eyes. Brush lip. <laughs> Say, uh, what have you been doing with yourself lately, Fred? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm on the radio, too, Mr. Kelowna. Oh, that's right. How could I have forgotten? You're on that fellow uh, Claghorn's program. Mr. Claghorn. <laughs> he's, uh, he's been giving me some small parts lately, throwaway parts, you know. But, Cloner, I understand you're over with one of your relatives for a home-cooked dinner. Now, yes, Fred, I'm just cooking a big, live Maine lobster. By the way, am I supposed to throw the lobster in the pot of boiling water, or does he throw me in the boiling water? Cloner, you imbecile, you throw the lobster in the water. You see, I was right, Lobby. Now, hand me a towel. <laughs> A British officer appears on the wide sweep of Boston Common and utters the words now famous in our history books. He says, What do you know? Parking space. <laughs> Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you one of the most thrilling incidents in American history. The ride of Paul Revere. <laughs> the time, midnight. The place, the old North Church in Boston. As our scene opens, we find one of the gallant minute men climbing to the tower of the old North Church to warn of the Redcoats' approach. It is drama. It is history. Listen. And uh, now let me see. One if I land and two if I see. No, it's two if I land or one if I see. God, I should have made a note of it. Here I am in the corner. Well, I'll put up three lights. Maybe they're amphibious. <laughs> Gosh, what a beautiful church. I feel like I'm doing a scene in a Crosby picture. <laughs> One if I land, two if I see. What's this writing on the wall here? 
Mm, Kilroy was here. <laughs> well, here's the belfry. Say, this is bed. I didn't didn't bring any matches with me. How'll I get a flame to light the lamp? Well, I can always rub two thoughts of Betty Grable together. <laughs> Well, lanterns are burning. I hope Paul Revere gets the message. (laughs) Ah, there's the light. The light, it's on. Wonderful. Now I can read what's happened to Dick Tracy. (laughs) Gee, that means the British are coming. The British are coming, and they're mad. That's what we get for charging them so much interest on that loan. (laughs) Well, I gotta go warn the people. Get here, get here. No doubt about it, I should never have bought this horse from Arthur Murray. Get in! <laughs> Mrs. Nussbaum! You was expecting me to be back here at all? <laughs> two arms, two arms! Of course, two arms! You're expecting me to knock the punch! <laughs> Mrs. Nussbaum, I'm Paul Revere. Revere? So already I, I sent your payments on the silverware. <laughs> You must listen to me, Mrs. Newsbaum. I've seen them with my own eyes. Thousands and thousands of redcoats. All I could see was redcoats. They're not wearing pants. <laughs> Mrs. Newsbaum, I'm not kidding. The British are coming. I know already. I'm writing a poem about them. A poem about the British? Yes. Very good. How does it go? The British is coming. The British is coming. But the slogan in 75. The country was saved by Paul Revere, who is long since not alive. (laughs) The British is coming and fighting, also retreating with many a loss. But, oi, what could have happened in Boston if Paul rode a Crosby horse? The British are coming! The British are coming! There's a cop, but I mustn't let him stop me. Halt in the name of the law! Halt in the name of General Howe! Halt in the name of His Majesty King George! Mayor Curley won't like this. <laughs> I should have recognized the Boston horse in the first place. I'm Paul Revere. Please don't stop me, officer. Sorry, I'll have to take your horse down to headquarters with me. My horse? What for? Carrying dope comes under the heading of illegal traffic. (laughs) But listen, I've got to warn the people. Too late now. The show's half over. (laughs) Officer, you don't understand. (laughs) You don't understand. I must warn the people of Boston. They're coming to kill us all. You mean the Cardinals are coming back? (laughs) Oh, how do you do? Well, Mr. Cassidy, the British are coming. (laughs) Mr. Cassidy, the British are coming. Stop shouting. I can't stand brass. You're not feeling well, Mr. Cassidy? (laughs) I'm not long for this world. (laughs) My bunions are as large as onions. Every time I bend over to tie my shoe, I get tears in my eyes. Never mind that, Ajax. The British are coming. The British, is it? Oh, where's me fowl and peace? Be there and be jabbers. Hand me me shillelagh. Be dad and be jabbers and sure now. <laughs> Do you talk like that naturally or was your mother frightened by Morton Down? <laughs> oh, hear me shillelagh. Take a boy and fight him and I'll go back to bed. Yeah, wait a minute, Mr. Cassidy. Don't you realize that if the British impose their taxes on us, you won't have a cent in your jeans? Taxation without representation is a tyranny. McGee's tyranny. Son, you sold me. What sold you? Sure, and I love that Gene tyranny. <laughs> the British are coming. The British are coming. The Brit- the- oh, my horse threw a shoe. I better stop at that village blacksmith shop and have a new one put on. Whoa, Nelly. Shoo, shoo, baby, your models are up to the seventh 
Smithy. Yes, Smithy. Yes, what do you want? Uh, the British are coming, and my horse needs a new horseshoe. One of your old ones will do. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> if you're in such a hurry, why don't you let the horse ride you? No one will know the difference. <laughs> don't fool around, Smithy. I'm in a hurry. Thousands of men are coming up that hill. Thousands of men? Goodness, I'll get my gun. And keep them out of here? Keep them out? <laughs> oh, he's so young, is he? <laughs> You know what it is. Oh, thanks for the memory of Boston history that forged our liberty and gave us this great heritage, a land of liberty. And we thank you so much. And thanks for the memory of a nation that's so great that they're willing to donate to keep alive our community drive so folks don't hesitate. And we thank you so much. Folks, the USOs, still in their serving to those servicemen who are so deserving, ladies and gentlemen. So let's help in this work by not swerving and fill that request to the community chest. I want to thank Fred Allen for this wonderful show tonight. And I'll be over and do it for you Sunday, Fred. Sunday night. And thanks for that wonderful bunch of talent down in the alley. Aren't they swell, huh? Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I started to say something about the community chest, but we were a little late. And you know how it is on the radio when you're a little late, you get cut off like the second cousins in Grandpappy's will. I said, folks, a word about the community chest, and the next thing I hear is bong, bong, bong. What I was going to say was this. 
During the war, nobody came around with a sterilized needle and bottle and said, Hold still, you. We're taking a pint of your blood. But we gave plenty of blood, didn't we? Nobody held a gun in our back and said, Hey, you, fork over 1875. You're buying a bond. But we bought plenty of bonds, didn't we? Nobody came around on Sunday night and said, Report at Lockheed first thing Monday morning. But we turned out plenty of planes. And nobody's going to hammer on our door tonight and say, It's community chest time, brother. Fork over that wallet. But what do you say we all hammer on the door of our community chest and say, Here's the wallet, brother. Take out a little for my fellow Americans. Good night. <laughs>